Alright, hello and welcome everyone to another interview. My name is Risk and um, the guy I'm interviewing today is one of the rising stars in Danish CSGO. One could say, one could also say that he is one of the legends of, of, of CSGO and CSOs in general because he has been around for a long time now and now once again is, is very relevant with his current team, Team Dignitas and uh, because they of course just qualified for the major down in uh, DreamHack Cluj. The one and only of course, Pimp. Hello man, how are you? I'm just fine. Uh, just fine. So, so basically, to start this interview off, um, I'm just gonna gonna mention something because you were literally just a few days ago winning a tournament down in Denmark. Uh, we ha had a few moments to chat. So, how how in general was that event, the League of Sharks event? Um, I guess it was fine. Like it was a small event. It was not like a, a big international event for us. Um, we didn't actually knew that we had to play the the League of Sharks tournaments. Uh, I think one 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 and a half week before we actually went there uh, in the final, so it's just something we took along the lines, and it was great being at a Danish event again, and of course great that we actually won the tournament. Awesome. So uh, to start it off, uh, I ask all the other guys I've interviewed this question. So the first time you ever like started playing CS, what was that? Was it a friend? Was it someone else like introduced you to Counter Strike in general? Or just did you just pop it off on Steam and find it? Uh, yeah, my cousin uh, was actually playing Counter Strike um, when he was, I think he was, I don't know, 16 or 17 years old, and I was like 9, 10, 11 years old uh, back then. And whenever I was at uh, his place, we we played Counter Strike, and he was the guy introducing me to Counter Strike uh, in general. And then when I got my first, uh, I got my first PC when I was 12 years old, I think. Then I started to uh, to play myself. I bought the game myself and, and started to play on my own. Okay, cool. So moving moving a bit further into it, um, you, you played the game yourself, uh, picking up some hours. So the first real entrance into the, the competitive part of CS, like getting into teams, I, I can imagine that was back in the Source days. Could you, could you give us some kind of intro on kind of like your first teams who were in it, who helped shape your career in the beginning? Well, the first three years was, was all about playing for fun, uh, I guess, um, playing gun game on, on claiming home the servers and, and all that kind of stuff, you, you know it. Um, so yeah, like the, my first introduction to like the serious part of, of playing Counter-Strike was probably when I was 14 years old, I think. Um, I, I, I started to find out that you could actually play uh, teams against teams and not just uh, gun game and, and surf and stuff like that. And I, I really got into it fast because I've already uh, always been very competitive minded so so when I figured out that I could actually uh, be competitive in, in a game I really thought was fun then then I started with that right away so around when I was 14 years old I think um, then there was a few like uh, not, not pro teams but I started out playing with with some uh, some of my uh, in real life mates and, and kind of moved up from there and I guess my first real semi-professional team was was when I joined speed gaming in uh, I think that was in 2011 maybe yeah. in source and and joined up with MSL um, Nile and some of the guys I've been playing CSGO with too. Cool. So in that part of your early career, you mentioned speed gaming yourself back in the CSO days. Um, like, how was that? Because it's very different from what we have today. Um, today, CSGO is, is so big. There's all these big major tournaments going on. Everyone's watching. Um, Im immense amount of fans on Twitter and all stuff like that. So for those, who, those guys who weren't around back then, like, can you kind of explain how was the scene like how small was it what was going on like how was it playing back then well back then it was just fun i guess like we we all played to have fun like money was just a, a side bonus like and and the money was really small there was not you're not really earning anything and like going to a danish event for an example would would often cost you more than you could actually win in in the first place so it was, it was not about the money it was just about having fun and, and competing in in a game that you found fun and of course meet people on online and stuff like that so in, in, in that aspect, like the, the game has changed a lot uh, compared to now where, where the money is, is quite big and you can actually afford to, to live uh, only by playing Counter-Strike right now. Um, that was totally, um, like, have, have you said that to me back then? Then people would have laughed, laughed at you. Uh, yeah. that's, that's how simple it is. Um, also, like some of, some of the online tournaments that are right now, you, you win more money than you have ever could, uh, could win at, uh, at Danish lane events and, and stuff like that. So that whole aspect has just grown uh, a lot. Yeah. So, yeah. To, sorry to cut you off, but to yeah, sure. to uh, to to bring on that whole thing, like living off it. I just read on Twitter that you are you're moving into your own place. Is yeah. that to to focus 100% on CS as well, or are you still doing something on the side? Well, that's uh, a step in that direction. I guess it's it's just a, another step in my life. I guess um, I moved out from my parents' house uh, a half a year ago, 
into my sister's apartment. Um, she had a spot left, so I could live here. And now I'm getting my own place and, and taking uh, the next step, you can say, in my life. And I guess that would uh, give me a little, like, of course, it would give me more space in, in general. And, and living at my own place will, of course, give me uh, more, I guess, confidence and, and silence around me, if you can say so. Yeah. Um, so maybe that will help. Um, I don't know. But uh, yeah, that's basically just the next step in, in, in my life, I guess. Okay, so from something that's pretty awesome for you, I'm gonna go back to something that I know you probably you probably won't like it, but back in source, um, there was because most of the guys back in source either heard about you because they knew you from the Danish scene, or they heard about you when the whole ambient occlusion thing happened. Um, and I think it's it's pretty relevant because we have, we've had a lot of, of cheating accusations and such on in CS:GO. Even some players being banned is of course something else because you didn't cheat. It was something else, but still, can you kind of like reiterate or kind of tell that story again? Because I, I think it's it's very relevant for you as a player to what what happened back then. Well, to to cut it short, uh, back then we we played. I played with MSL and I played with some of those guys in, in speed gaming, and um, we always played something called B rush. Uh, we come came home from school and we we joined the server and we were like seven or eight guys, always the same guys. Um, playing together and playing something called Beerus. And back then, when ambient occlusion came out, like it was something everyone could use. So the, the real story, and I'm, I'm not sure I've told it before um, of, of different versions, but but we always like played that Beerus, and we all of all of us used ambient occlusion from time to time just to piss each other off, because <laughs> that's what yeah. we did back then. Um, and that was both me, MSL, Nille, Gilsmark, Eisenberg. Like we, yeah. we just did it against each other. Um, yeah, I did it as well, so no worries. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> everyone, everyone did it. it. Because it's it's just a command, you know, in in Nvidia graphic driver. It's not something you download or anything like that. It's not like um, cheat in in that sense, if you can say so. Uh, the problem with me was, of course, that I uh, I used it in a in a you can say official game. I used it in a in a day day night cup or whatever it's called. Something called Caswell. Uh, we played in uh, in Source a lot. Um, and the thing is that that. I wasn't intending to do it actually. Uh, I played B Rush and I had ambient occlusion off. I closed down the game and then at the night that we were playing the first game, uh, I think it was four or five rounds into the game, I I um, I saw that I still had ambient occlusion on. So I was just like, "Fuck, <laughs> that was not supposed to to happen." And I knew that we were playing with a uh, we were playing with some kind of anti cheat. Um, yeah. So I knew that that would be fucked up. Um, so I just decided to to play on with. Uh, what I should have done, of course, is is just lift the game, told everyone the truth, but. When you're 15 years old and and you know that you fucked up and it wasn't uh, unproposed, then then you I I just made the wrong decision I guess and and kept continuing playing with it, um, which eventually costed me uh, this whole ambient occlusion case. Yeah, because what happened after then was um, gaming.dk picked it up, uh, which was back then the resident uh, CSO side, not so much anymore. I think the pretty low on coverage. I I actually even remember Cadre.org back then also had something going on with it. So. There was this whole part where your name just got destroyed. Um, how how did you bounce back from that? Or both both on a personal level, but also on a uh, professional level in in CS. Like how how do you come back from a from a story like that? I don't know. I, I guess there are different reasons to it. Uh, I mean, would have ha would it have happened for someone else? I'm not sure that that they actually could have bounced back. Um, I think. One of the the forces I had back then, even when I was 15 years old, 16 years old, I was like, I'm I'm good at speaking, I'm good at explaining myself. I think I'm good at uh, elaborating my my thoughts and and coming up with with decent points. And I guess in in the whole um, in the whole week where where everything was going on, I, I guess that helped me a lot, like actually discussing what what happened and discussing what's fair and what's not fair um, in in that uh, in that sense. And I think that helped me a lot, to be honest. Um, so. That 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 basically what what was helped me not to get banned for like two years or, or something like that. It was only four months, I think. Um, so that's a part of the reason. Another part is is that I always found motivation is in in like haters and in in like people not believing in you or in or in in general just people not believing in in what you do. Um, yeah. And and of course uh, that generates a lot of motivation to to actually fight back and and like I know what happened. I know it shouldn't have happened. And I know that. Uh, nevertheless, what you say, uh, ambient occlusion didn't help me. I was still a, a really skilled player back then, so I know that if I just kept on fighting, it would eventually go away, and I would show people what I'm really made of, and that's what I did. Yeah, because I remember back in those days, like some guys were still talking, talking that shit, and all that going on. 
And every time I either like came to a LAN event and you were there or saw something posted on Facebook, you were always like playing and practicing despite people saying, oh yeah, he's just a cheat and all that. You just continued playing. And that's also, I think, something you carried on um, with you in, into Go as well because you're one of those guys that, at least from a neutral standpoint, everyone thinks that you just put in the hours. Like, I kind of like this. There's, there's been a picture of you and there's been a picture of, I think, Get Right like coming to the venue three hours before everyone else, sitting at the venue three hours after everyone else has gone home and still sitting there, still trying to get better and, and proving those haters wrong. So yeah, I think that's that's a great point uh, coming up. But um, another another thing here to uh, to, to transition in, uh, the source days, of course, glory days, everyone was doing it for fun. Um, and then, then came the whole transition into Go. Can you kind of like give, shed some light on, on what happened in, in the minds of the pro players, at least in the source scene, the one you know, when CSGO was coming in and CS Source was dying out? Well, I guess uh, what we have in common with the 1.6 players back then was that we all thought that CSGO was more or less uh, a horrible game. Like we all, yeah. we all had the feeling that CSGO is, is never going to uh, unite us because it's a, it's a shit game to say the, to say at least. Um, I guess Valve did a great job actually updating it. Uh, Valve did a great job uh, eventually making it a good game, as we see it today. It, it is a really competitive and a really good game, as, as you can see, in so many different aspects. Um, for me personally, uh, I decided not to, to go to go uh, back then. I, I played Counter-Strike Source for, I don't know, two years uh, semi-professionally and used a lot of hours, and I was not sure that I, I could uh, justify to myself putting in so many hours in a game I didn't like at all. Um, so the first two weeks after CSGO came out, I, I actually didn't buy it at all. I didn't have CSGO, I didn't play CS at all uh, in that period. Um, but I, I started missing it early, so I was thinking to myself, like, I, I can't skip Counter-Strike. No matter how bad a game it is, uh, I just have to live with it and, and learn it, I guess. Um, so I did that, and after two weeks, uh, I, I started playing, and, and just after I started playing, uh, I, I found together with uh, MSL, Roga, and... I think it was Cajun and Nilly back then, uh, and we formed a Nexus, uh, and pretty much we are uh, a top eight team in, in the world right away in CSGO, to be honest. Yeah, because what, what happened, for those of you guys not into, into the other parts of CSGO, was that you were in the Nexus team, you were doing really well, and then you were removed from the team because they wanted to pick up um, the UK team with Rattlesnake and all that stuff. Like, how, how can, you, can you shed some light on that period? Because I, I know a lot of people, or technically back then not really <laughs> that many people but still some people were, were outraged that picking up a team that only because of their names when they had you guys the stable lineup like how was that all well it was a joke to us to be honest it was just after we finished second at Mad Catch Vienna and at that time that event was was the most competitive event CSGO has ever seen um, and we finished second so that was a huge surprise both to us individually but of course also to a Nexus uh, and then Still, despite the fact that we, we finished second in, in the most competitive tournament that CSGO has ever seen, we still got dropped. Um, and it was, like, it was just a joke to us because that, that made no sense because we knew we were 100 times better than the Rattlesnake guys and, and all of those guys. But they made that choice and I guess it, it only bit themselves. Uh, like they're, they're the ones uh, missing us because two weeks after, uh, we went to Copenhagen Games, who at that time were the most competitive event CSGO has ever seen, and finished second again. So. And I think the other Nexus team with Rattlesnake finished 9 to, to 12 or even 13 to 16 or something like that. So they were playing horrible um, and we finished second and were at the time considered a, a top three team in the world. So I guess they really, they really made, a, made, a, made a fail there, you can say so. <laughs> yeah, so uh, definitely. But they can blame themselves. Yeah, but the fun part is that actually today, of course, we have, we have you guys in Dignitas. We also have TSM who I think anyone would say, okay, they're top three, if not top two team in the world right now but but back in those days you guys were actually the best Danish team and from the period between uh, the Annexus slash Western Wolves team that as you just said came to Copenhagen Games second Mad Cats Vienna second and until TSM really started winning actually when they went from Dignitas to TSM back in those days there were no top level Danish teams do you have any idea because the scene was the same the players were there do you have any idea why there wasn't a top, top, top level Danish teams between those two periods? Not really. I, I guess it's just a, a matter of timing. Um, I mean, it, you have to have teams who, who have the right players and, and the right teams. Like you can have really skilled players, uh, but if, if the chemistry between the five players or if, if the roles between the five players are, are not correct or are not satisfying, then the team won't be good. And I guess the talent, as you said, have always been there in the Danish scene. It was just a matter of timing and 
meta of Rostock uh, constellations that, that, that were at that time that might not fit everyone. And I guess CSGO was was uh, a part of the reason why that was all shaked up, you know. So so we actually got some of the, the competitive teams back, uh, as, as you said, that we've seen before. Okay, so to pick it a, a little bit further into the future, because of course the, the guys who were now TSM back then in Dignitas, they were playing pretty well, they even came what was it? I don't know, eight to seven to eighth at at the major in Cologne in 2014 or something like that, or the quarterfinal, semifinal. I can't really remember, but they did well, and then they went to the uh, MLG event and announced that they were going to be joining TSM. And at the same time, Dignitas, of course, still wanting a Danish Danish team, picked up you guys um, back when you started with the lineup with uh, with Kevy and AC and those guys. Can can you tell us a little bit about that period because that whole shuffle? Not really player shuffle as much as we used to in the Danish scene because that happens, but organization shuffle. Can you tell us about that period? Well, it was a period where we had to uh, redeem ourselves, you can say so. Um, it was after a period where I played in 3D Max and Copenhagen Wolves, um, and we hadn't been doing great. Like We went from being Western Wolves, one of the best teams in the world, to not even being a top 10 team in the world. Um, so that was a, a hard time for us, I guess. Uh, around that time when, when Dignis has... Um, decided to leave and, and go to TSM. Um, we were like still a new team. We had just uh, brought in Icy again. We had just brought in Fetish. Um, Kerby is, is one of the new talents back then. Um, just brought him in. So we were kind of redefining ourselves and, and redefining what we should do for the future. And Dignitas, hopefully, uh, and luckily for us, were, were just on board with that. And they, they took us in right away um, after, uh, even before uh, Dignitas, the old TSM, the now TSM lineup uh, left them. So we actually had a deal with, oh. with Team Dignitas even before um, even before the old things just left them, uh, because they knew that were go going to happen uh, okay. to TSM. Um, we also got an offer from Copenhagen Wolves, but but things just were simply the better offer and, and the better fit for us at that time. Um, so that's that's how it went down. Uh, and yeah, it was it was just a, a messy period. But but after that, we we, we landed things just and we started to perform decently with Fitches. Um, but then again, uh, something was missing, and we ended up uh, kicking Fitches and, and replacing with them as well. Yeah, so that was actually my next question because you replaced Fetish with MSL. Um, I like, how d how do you think those two differ? Because it's pretty clear if you followed CS for a while that Fetish is the more kind of like he wants to go down with everything, have everything under control, type of leader who will put everything down to pins and stuff. How is he different from from MSL, who's uh, who was your in-game leader back then and probably also still is today? To put it simple, MSL is just twice as skilled as Fetish is. Um, the lack of firepower. From Fetish was was just too much for us. Um, it it worked in for him in, in when he played in Team Ding just because he had players like uh, Kate on device. Um, Shipnix back then was was really strong as well. Uh, Dupree of course is, is another one. They were really really strong individual players, um, which is why it, it worked for them to have a, a caller who, who didn't really bring up uh, any firepower. Um, to be fair to Fittis, he was also better, performing better when he played in in Ding just with Dupree and device and those guys. With us, he was just. Um, like he was not himself, I guess he was just too bad to 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 say the to say it honestly. Um, so we needed firepower and and we needed MSL because MSL knew how we wanted to play because we've all played with MSL before. Uh, as as I said, it was one of the guys I started playing with back in CS Source like five years ago. So we know each other well and we know how we want to play. And and he he just uh, fitted us better uh, as as a caller. His his style of in-game leading is is what we want and and not what Fittis could offer us, uh, despite the lack of firepower as well. Okay, cool. So, actually, talk, talking back to uh, to the whole MSL and, and the guys you started playing with, um, I think Nile also one of the guys that you started playing with a, a long time ago. I think he's still some kind of band. I'm not sure he, what what the what the story is, but um, if if Nile came back, <laughs> would 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 he be uh, a th an option for your team, or would that just be not fitting? Because like the whole thing with 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 the MSL goes a long way back, so. If if Nile was an option, would you consider it? Uh, maybe uh, I don't know. Nile is, is a really unique player in terms of what he offers to a team because he he's a player which is unique right uh, right now that that doesn't care about that doesn't care about what all the people thinks about him uh, not not as much as everyone else at least. So he's a guy who who easily would go in first and drag all the attention, drag all the shots, and and let the the carries on the team do the revenge kills and then clutch the rounds home for the teams. Uh, and and having a player like Nilla on your team is, is is a really unique thing today because there are no such type of players. Everyone wants to to be in the ramp uh, light, if you can say so. Like everyone wants to to uh, to yeah to feel good and and feel like 
like everyone loves them for their skill, uh, despite uh, despite that they maybe should be loved for, for their commitment to the team instead. Um, that's how it is. That's how it always will be with fans. Uh, it, that's how it is in, in all sports. Like uh, the coach um, in, let's say, curling, for an example, I know that the coach and the coaching uh, guys behind the curling team have a lot to say in, in how the team should play, but you never hear about a coach in curling. Um, <laughs> <laughs> for to take it out as an extreme example, but same with football players. Messi will always get more attention. Messi will always have more fans than than John Terry, for an example, for Chelsea, who is a equally good defender. Uh, yeah. So that's how it is, um, and that's what makes you uh, nearly unique. If if we would have brought him in, I don't know, but if if we needed a type like him, that if we had the firepower that we thought we should need, uh, bringing in Nilly would not be out of question if we weren't banned. So talking about uh, new players and adding players to the lineup, because recently you removed Nico, an old CS Source legend, a legendary all player, and uh, I and many others could have seen like why, because his his form was steadily declining. In the beginning of a go, to give some kind of backstory, Nico was one of the best opposites in the game, uh, no question. He was up there with Guardian and those guys, and sadly the his form has been declining, and and the orb has proved to be not as detrimental and important as it was back then. It is still, of course, important now. You can see the players like Kenny S and Guardian and JW still pulling out. But Nico did not follow suit. So you p replaced him with Snyder. Can you kind of like tell us more about that that whole thing? Because that is a, a huge change, both in player personality, but also in communication, because Snyder is Swedish. Yeah, um, we've been playing for Nico for, for a long time, and he simply didn't... He never really got back to his level, as you said. He was he was one of the best orbs in 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 Europe and in the world back then in in Western worlds. But he never really got back to the level that that we needed him to be on. Um, that's that's a shame. But but we in the end we just had to to replace him because he wasn't performing uh, as well as he should, and he was kind of dragging us uh, a little bit back. Like he was, we were not playing up to our full potential, mainly because he would hold us a big bad with his individual performances and. It's never fun to say such things about your mates, but that's how the reality were, um, and which is why we we decided to to replace him with Snyder. Um, Snyder, as you said, is, is a really skilled player. He's a Swedish player, so we have a little problems with the communication. But it's uh, we're right now we're doing it half Danish, half English, and it's it's going decent compared to how how long time he has actually been playing with us. It's it's not. Uh, I think it's three weeks ago we we played with him the first time, so four weeks ago and. Considering that that amount of time, we have actually improved uh, a lot, I think, and and we still have two or three or more weeks to improve before the major is 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 going off. Yeah, so so to talk a bit more about Schneider, because I did a, an interview with Devil Walk a few weeks back, and I asked him about the same question Schneider joining Disney Tars, and he said uh, Schneider was one of the best pickups you could have done because his his potential is is pretty pretty much endless, and Snyder, uh, Devil Walk actually said that he ranks Schneider as one of the best aimers in the world, so. Is is he the missing link for for a Danish team, funnily enough, a Swedish guy, or like, can you imagine anyone better than him in your team? Well, to be honest, uh, had a player like Config uh, broke out just two months before, I, I wouldn't uh, I wouldn't say that we wouldn't have picked Config for an example because he's a really skilled player and he has done uh, excellent in SK gaming so far. Um, young talent and and playing really well also at LAN. But at the time we needed a new guy. Uh, Config hadn't broke out. Config hadn't been playing at any LAN, so. We simply couldn't take the risk of bringing in, bringing in any Danish guys because there there were simply no Danish guy that had proved themselves to be good enough to play in Team Dignitas. Um, so we started to look uh, towards Sweden, and Snyder was was the first guy we 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 came up with. And like as you said, I, th I think he could be the the, the missing link uh, that we need because he is, as you said, really skilled. Uh, what we need to work on is is getting his his way of playing, his style of playing is totally different to to what we do. Um, in general, Danish and Swedish CS is is two different things. Um, Swedes are, are more loose and do more random stuff, while the Danish players are, are trying to think a bit more about what's what's smart and what's not smart, and then maybe hesitate a bit compared to the Swedish players who just do whatever they feel for, um, which can be both a good and a bad thing. Um, what we need to work on is with, with Snyder is making him feel comfortable in, in our way of playing and, of course, uh, the communication as well. Cool. So looking at the team now as it is now, because you you guys been at some recent tournaments, uh, of course, as we mentioned, the, the League of Sharks event down in NPF, which you won over SK Gaming. Three to zero. Congratulations with that once again. But you, you also uh, you also went to DreamHack London not too too many too many weeks ago, as well, and actually did really really well. Sadly got got beaten by TSM in that was it semi-final. Yeah. Um, also a really great result with these two and also the Definity result uh, weeks back before that. 
Do, do you feel like your team is ready with, of course, the, uh, the couple of weeks more training to go into that DreamHack Cluj Major? Uh, I would say that we're ready to, to take our chance. Uh, I wouldn't say that we were that ready that we feel that we actually have to go out of the group stage. That, of course, that's our goal, and, and saying anything else would, would be a lie, but uh, expecting that we can be a top eight team already with Snyder uh, consistently at our major, where the pressure is, is so high, um, I'm not sure that we can expect that. Um, I think we can do it. And I think that we have the potential to do it. Um, if two weeks is enough, come consider that we have some communication issues that other teams simply don't have because they're all from the same uh, nationality. I, I, I really don't know. But but as you said, that our results have been fine. We've played uh, a fairly close match against TSM. We played a close match, uh, a close map. Uh, I think second map in, in that semifinal was 16 to 14. Yeah. And we were actually leading 14 to 11. So we sh sh probably should have at least gotten to every time or even won the second map and, and got it to a third map. Um, so we have shown potential. Um, yesterday we beat at Navi in the ESL ECL league, and we are currently third, I think, in that league. And that's basically the the 12th best European teams. Um, I think SK is, is the only team that are in that league. You can say that that could be replaced by someone like Gamers 2 or something like that. But besides that, we have the the 11 best European teams in in that league. And and right now being third in that league is is also a great result for us. Uh, so I think we have a lot of potential to work uh, work on, for yeah. sure. Because my next question would be, in general, like if we look um, further on from the major, if we, for example, imagine, okay, you guys get out of groups, you don't win the event, which is something that I think is, is, is pretty likely to happen. I think you guys could progress out of that. So you go after the major, wh what's the future looking like for Team Dignitas? Um, are you just going to continue improving? What kind of what kind of tournaments do you think? Uh, are you going to aim for the ESA, ESA, ESL Pro League <laughs> finals? or wh how, how does the future look for you? Well, we, we don't really know. Like, we have Sebo coming up. Uh, we played Sebo group stage two, and we finished second after Titan in that group stage. Again, with, uh, I think, the likes of Gamers 2, Mouse Sports, Halo Racers, uh, are some of the teams that didn't make it, uh, and we did. So we have Sebo coming up just after the Major. I think it's a week after we come home from the Major. Um, and after that, we, we don't really know. Uh, DreamHack Winter we will not be att attending, because uh, they, they collided with uh, Face It and, and made a made a Face It DreamHack tournament in, in collaboration and we didn't play the Face It League in the beginning because it uh, collided with some other stuff that we had going on so uh, of course uh, unfortunately DreamHack window will uh, will not be possible for us um, but I, I don't really know what we have of course we'll we'll try and see how it goes to the major and see if there's anything we can work on or see like if we show great potential at the major if we come top 8 then of course there's a lot to work on let's say we, we cross out group stage playing horrible there must be some reasons to that, and, and our, our finest uh, job when we come home from a major like that is, is to figure out what's the reason and what can we do to fix them. Um, and that's, that's basically what, what our focus will be after the major. Okay, cool. So to transition into something not really about your team, but actually on, on the topic of fixing things, um, because on all the, the Reddit threads and HLTV forums, there's always people talking about the weapon balance in the game right now. and. You guys, of course, the pro players will know all about that that balance, and especially leading into a, a huge event as 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 the next major. So, what what do you think about the balance at the moment with the M4A4, M4A1S, all that stuff? I think it's. Uh, I think I really think Valve did a, a really great job. Uh, and and bear in mind that there was the first like they they made the change to the to the silencer, and everyone was complaining, but they stuck with it. And now I think everyone has actually settled with the fact that. It's, it's two different guns now that can be used for two different uh, purposes. Uh, admittedly, the aim for A4 uh, with, with 30 bullets are better in, in close range distance, and if you have to shoot many fast, uh, if you can say so, where the silencer is, is good on, on mid range and long duels uh, in, in general. Um, so I guess you're, it, it actually forced us pro players to, to think about what positions to have on, on, on the maps and is, is the cult good in this spot and can I use it here? And, would it might be better if I took the, the 30 bullet cult here and, and stuff like that, and you you really doubt it. Like you, you can't really settle your mind settle your mind around which cult you should use, and that indicates that they actually are balanced. Like they are so close to each other that you don't really know what what to do. And consider that there was Valve's first uh, shot, first update. They didn't redo anything. Um, that was highly impressive to me because they have a they have a history of fucking things up uh, <laughs> when when they do major updates with with the deagle with. Uh, I think it was the the AUG uh, at at some place. There was uh, an an AVP with 30 bullets uh, and and stuff like that. It was just sick. Um, so that they did it in the first shot, if you can say so. That was highly impressive to me. And I think I think it's working out great. I think it's a it's a great balance. And and you still see top teams switching around between 
the, the M4A4 and, and the M4A1 because they, they simply can't settle for, for what they think is the best. Okay, cool. So now, now pretty much all my questions are answered, and so I'm just gonna gonna tap into some some of the things that I've thought of during it's in this interview. Um, sure. To 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 go back to the major because we all know every CS fan knows when the major is coming up. That's the only thing that people want to see, the only thing that people want to hear about. And I would like to get your opinion. Um, if if you put your own team out of the window and just look at the major as an expert in CS, what? three teams do you think will, will finish top? You don't have to pick a winner. You can maybe pick two final teams and then a third place team. It would be ballsy of you to pick a winner, but uh, let me hear your predictions. Uh, I think it's uh, it's not easy because all teams are so close right now, but I think exactly. Fnatic, despite having having seemed uh, not not so great lately, they've like lost matches and not just lost them, they've like been demolished by teams like TSM and, and Envios, which is not the way you see Fnatic play. Like every time they they should lose, it's always close matches. But this time it has actually been demolished by by both TSM and, and MVS. Despite that, I I still think they have what it takes to to go top three. They are still superior and they're still a, a such a skilled team that they can win anyone uh, and and should win against anyone. Um, so I I guess they will be one of my uh, top three uh, contenders at least. Um, then TSM obviously uh, the best team in the world in my opinion right now. Uh, haven't lost a map. Uh, like the last 22 mat matches yeah. they've played, they've won it. It's it's sick, uh, especially nowadays where everyone is so close and we have so many close matches and so many good teams um, putting up such a record is, is highly impressive. Um, so they will be another and they will be my finalist also uh, together with Envios probably. I think I think TSM and Envios are, are the two most likely teams to go in the final. Uh, I think both Envios and TSM will beat Fnatic in, in a semi-final uh, should they meet. Um, and yeah, I, I really think those are the three teams that you, you should look out for and possibly one of the, the next major winners. Cool. Okay, so thank you. I, th I think actually that's that's a pretty good answer. I agree with that. Um, that's that's pretty clever. Um, to bring it to something else, because in Denmark there's been a lot of stuff going on lately with esports, and esports has actually, in Denmark, become more widely recognized right now. We have down in, in Vile, we have the Sports College, who offers uh, esports education through high school level. Uh, TV2 Sulu, uh, a major Danish channel, just picked up um, an esports program. Hopefully, they'll start doing CSGO. Right now, they're doing Dota. Um, so, what I wanted to ask you is, is, can you feel, like in your general life in Denmark, that people have become more acceptive or esports has grown? Can you feel that, like, not walking on the street, people saying hi, but like maybe for friends who didn't really know about esports before, come up to you, ask you about something? Yeah, it it has changed a lot. Like uh, where I live in in Aalborg, like two years ago, no one would like people knew who I were, but but people would not stop me in the street and and ask for a picture and stuff like that. But that happens now. Um, so that's a clear difference, as you say. Um, in general, esports in Denmark has has just evolved and improved a lot. I think like. Sweden was always the great example uh, because three years ago uh, eSport was accepted in Sweden and, and the first companies in, in Sweden, TV stations and, and stuff like that were, were having uh, having stories about eSport and and treating it like a real sport, I guess, or treating like uh, not just some, some freaky, uh, freaky niche um, as, as a lot of countries still are doing, uh, as Denmark was doing for three years ago. Now Denmark has actually realized that, that it's big and, and it has such a big audience that, that, um, that it's actually worth investing in and uh, investing in time and investing journalists to, to write about and all that kind of stuff. Um, and that helps uh, everything from, from, as you said, from, from being recognized on the street to, to future in, in, in TV spots and on national TV. It, it all just grows and it will only become better uh, by time, I think. I think that is a, that is a, a good place to end the interview and in a happy place. That's always yeah. what you should do. So, um, yeah, only continue to grow. Hopefully I can say the same for you and your career, Pimp. Um, it's been a pleasure talking to you. And um, I'll give you the last the last chance to, to give any shout-outs to potential sponsors, teams like that, teammates, your mom, everyone. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's your chance, your shot to say something. Well, yeah, thanks for listening to me. I hope it was uh, exciting. Uh, and yeah, go go support our team, uh, Team Dignitas. We are we are the second best Danish team. We we opt to be the best, of course. Um, and being the best Danish team would mean that we probably would have to be the best team in the world, which is uh, which is quite hard. But uh, be sure that uh, be sure that we will try and and fight for it. That's that's one thing that is 100% sure. So we need your support if uh, if we want that to to happen. Okay, awesome man. Thank you for the interview, and I will see you later. Bye for now.